Welcome to Physician Focus. I'm Dr. Dale McGee. The severity and long-term health effects of concussions are now recognized at all levels of sports, from the professional ranks to youth leagues, from coaches to parents and players. According to estimates from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, up to four million concussions from sports and recreational activities occur each year in the U.S. In Massachusetts alone, reports from middle and high schools show that more than 4,400 concussions and head injuries may occur in a single year. The good news is that injuries once considered minor are now being given the serious attention they deserve. New laws have been passed in many states regulating reporting requirements and safety protocols. Here in Massachusetts, for example, school districts have to report concussions to the state and have a protocol in place for managing players with a concussion. Yet some medical experts express concern that an excessive fear for concussions has arisen, thus discouraging parents and health experts from letting children play healthy team sports, especially as obesity rates continue to be high among young people. This edition of Physician Focus will examine the latest information on concussions, their causes, their health consequences, and what is being done to reduce the incidence of concussions. Our special guest today is Dr. Ann McKee. Dr. McKee is Chief of Neuropathology at the VA Boston Health System and a Professor of Neurology and Pathology at Boston University School of Medicine. She directs the brain banks for the BU Alzheimer's Disease Center and the Chronic Traumatic Encephalopathy Program a widely published author of peer-reviewed papers. She's also appeared before Congress and the National Football League. She has been featured on public television's Frontline and CBS's 60 Minutes, as well as other news documentaries regarding the risks and health effects of concussion and head trauma. Welcome, Dr. McGee. Well, thank you for having me. Well, it's great to have you here today, and I think this is a very timely and important problem. A lot of attention is being paid to the risks of, of brain injury, concussion, and the like. Now, tell us, what is a concussion? Well, a concussion is an impact to the head that causes uh, really microstructural changes in the brain and, and causes uh, symptoms and signs. Okay. So it's a, it's a, it's a very kind of uh, vague entity. It can be a variety of neurologic signs and symptoms, and it's really just an impact-related uh, uh, set of, of changes in the brain. So how would, how would a athlete suspect that they were having a concussion? What would happen to them that would make them want to you know, signal their coach or the like? Well, uh, you know, it, it can be all sorts of different things. I mean, mm -hmm. the symptoms of concussion uh, can be headache, trouble with vision, uh, trouble with balance, nausea even. It mm -hmm. doesn't have to include loss of consciousness, mm -hmm. although that sometimes occurs. Uh, also, you can be confused, inattentive, not really know where you are. You can have memory disturbances. Uh, and um, uh, those are the main features. Sometimes you can have sleep disturbances. So mm -hmm. it's a sort of a long list of different symptoms. You, some, you feel like you're just not right. So it also sounds like sometimes others might notice the changes before the person themselves notices. Oh, absolutely, and that's yeah. why it's so important for teammates yeah. uh, to be aware of, of their fellow uh, team members, just because mm -hmm. they might notice confusion, going to the wrong bench, for example, mm -hmm. uh, 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 you know, just sort of an unusual stance, maybe imbalance when they're walking, and the person themselves may not be aware of it at all. And, and does it always happen instantly with a trauma, or is it something that may evolve over a period of time and perhaps they become aware of it hours or whatever later? Well, that's absolutely true. Sometimes symptoms come on immediately, mm -hmm. but sometimes they're delayed and they may not come up for a day or two. And so it's important that people realize that if you had an impact, uh, you sort of need to be uh, especially attentive to, mm -hmm. you know, if you're developing problems with sleep or restlessness, irritability, uh, depression, uh, and, you, and you really can't put your finger on it, but you know something's, something's wrong. And it, are there tests that can be run to, to say this person had a concussion or didn't have a concussion? Is there any way to rule it in or rule it out? Well, we don't have an absolute diagnostic test, like mm -hmm. a, you know, a blood test. And that's, of course, what we'd really like to have. Right now, it's a series of tests. So it's usually some balance testing, mm -hmm. some cognitive testing, uh, you know, a physical exam. Maybe, uh, in, it, depending on the different physician, it might involve uh, uh, visual testing. Uh, it, it's, a, it's sort of a, a, 
an assessment. It, mm -hmm. it involves multiple domains, and at the end of the of the testing, you you sort of look at what was wrong and what was not wrong, and you sort of come up with a general idea whether or not this person had a concussion. So, how soon would this examination need to be done after the traumatic event? Well, you want to pull a person out of play if mm -hmm. they're if they're suspected of having a concussion and have them immediate or evaluated by a medical professional mm -hmm. and not allowed to return to the game that same day. Mm -hmm. uh, so then they would, uh, you know, the, the evaluation would occur. Uh, if, if there was a concussion that was diagnosed, uh, the first thing is they get a, a cognitive and physical rest uh, with, you know, no stimulation. And then they're put through a stepwise, uh, very gradual return to former activities. But it's important to recognize that there may, co may be cognitive consequences to concussion. And the individual, especially the students, may have difficulty with their schoolwork afterwards. Mm -hmm. and, and so there needs to be recognition that, that it may be a delayed return to schoolwork. And uh, what happens? So they delay schoolwork, they feel that they've recovered, they return, they start playing again. Um, what happens if they have a second concussion? Is that just, are you just starting over again or is, or is two worse than one? Well, it's a complicated issue. I should say that most concussions resolve in seven to 10 days with absolutely no problems. Most mm -hmm. concussions are uh, you know, a self-limited event mm -hmm. and nothing to worry about. Uh, the second concussion be, is, is, can be worrisome because especially depending what the interval was uh, with the initial concussion. Mm -hmm. The shorter the interval, the more dangerous it is. You want the brain to be fully recovered uh, before they have that second concussion. If, if the brain is not fully recovered, uh, you can have a longer uh, uh, recovery to baseline uh, and you may have uh, more long-lasting symptoms. So we're in a situation where the diagnosis is a little difficult to make. Mm -hmm. It's not always definitive. It can be delayed in some occasions. The symptoms mm -hmm. might be delayed as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, it may be that more than one concussion is, is especially harmful if, if they occur. What about uh, just being out there bumping heads uh, in football or in soccer or the like? No concussion is noted. Um, does that do harm? Well, yes, uh, that's called subconcussion, and when you have minor impacts to the head, they don't give rise to the symptoms that we've just talked mm -hmm. about. In fact, the person's completely unaware that they're damaging themselves at all. But it, it, there's just uh, mounting evidence that shows that if you have these subconcussive hits uh, uh, continually throughout a season, like you do in football, it's estimated about 1,000 to 1,500 subconcussive hits per season per individual in football. And then in soccer, of course, there's the heading, which is a subconcussive concussive impact. Uh, and so it's been documented that, and hockey has it too, uh, so the, even in a high school student who plays a single season, ha doesn't have a concussion, uh, just the cumulative exposure to these subconcussive hits can cause changes in the brain. And those changes can be seen on cognitive tests and, as, and also on some neuroimaging, the white matter tracks in the brain. And these might be long lasting, they may not resolve? Well, we don't know. I mean, that's, you know, we're, we're, we're starting to follow those changes out, but we think most of those re reverse in time. We're not mm -hmm. exactly sure what the time frame is, but, you know, we're not sure if all of them resolve. And so it's, it's going to be very important over the next few years with, with this concern about concussion to really study student athletes, uh, follow them for a long time, probably even decades, mm -hmm. uh, just to see, you know, what, is the, what are the long-term ramifications of these things and can we identify problems very early on so we can intervene. So I, you know, I think another thing that's coming out here is, is that besides being difficult to diagnose, that we're also learning now about the long-term consequences of concussions. This isn't something that was appreciated in the past. It's something that's only coming to attention in the past several years. Yeah, there has been a lot of attention to that. I, I definitely want to say most concussions are well-managed and, and resolved. Right. Uh, a, a small percentage of developed post-concussive syndrome where they have persistent symptoms maybe for three months, maybe a year, and then they resolve. A very small proportion, and we don't know the exact exact number, if that's one of the difficulties we have right now, uh, go on to develop long-term problems. And our work at uh, BU and the VA in Boston has shown that it's really that, that development of that long-term neurodegeneration that we sometimes see uh, is uh, 
directly linked to the years of exposure of playing the contact sport. So the longer you play, the mm -hmm. higher your risk. Now, are there are there sports that are particularly dangerous? Uh, you know, we say contact sports, but can you sort them out as one worse than another? Uh, so it is a common problem. The estimates from last year in high school students were there were 160,000 concussions in football. Mm -hmm. That was the highest number. But the second highest number, 60,000, was in uh, women's soccer. Okay. And so it's not just a, you know, concussions aren't just for football. They're, they also occur in other sports. And then it was 45,000 in men's soccer. So that's another important feature of concussions. It appears that women are more susceptible. Mm -hmm. Now we don't know if it's uh, the, the specifics of their brain anatomy or their, their physiology that makes them more susceptible, or if it's because women report their symptoms more often. And it's, so they may actually report a concussion more frequently. But, so that's what we're trying to decipher, if women are more susceptible because of tendency to report or actual physio physiological differences. So, but, we, but still what you're saying is, is that in a single season, uh, an athlete has a significant chance of having some sort of trauma, a thousand hits to the head with football in one season, a significant risk of, of suffering a concussion from that. And uh, we're, our knowledge of this whole problem is evolving. We don't know the consequences. We're beginning to understand them as we spend more time looking further and further out as to just how these players do later in life. Right. Um, this is, uh, you know, just a recent problem, and we're and I, I, again, we really want to emphasize that team sports, contact sports, are terrific for kids, mm -hmm. and we don't want to take them out of these sports. But we want to play safe. Mm -hmm. We want to play smart, so that head impacts aren't, you know, putting our our long term health at risk. We know that there's. A, enormous benefits of physical exercise, both just physically, but also emotionally and psychologically. So we don't want to stop sports. Okay. And um, short of not partaking of these contact sports with the highest risk, are there other things that students or coaches can do to mitigate the risk? Well, I think, you know, we've just begun to tap into uh, developing skill sets that mm -hmm. would minimize the number of head impacts. In fact, there was a study from the University of New Hampshire uh, where they took off uh, football helmets in practice, I can't remember the details, but a couple of days a week, and they found that those athletes went on to suffer fewer concussions because in, by, by, by having to practice without a helmet, it modified their behavior so that they, they played football without their head so much in the game. Mm -hmm. And so that's just an easy solution. You know, that's a quick solution. But I think I think there can be a lot of different things that athletes can do. Uh, strengthening their neck muscles, bracing, uh, developing a, 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 a stiff neck prior to the hit also braces you from the injury and, and mitigates the impact. Mm -hmm. uh, and whether you ha it's a glancing blow or a direct blow, a glancing blow is much less likely to cause a concussion. So if you can glide away from the impact, you know, most concussions Concussions are a result of player-to-player -player contact. Mm -hmm. But if, and if you know that the inj if the blow is coming, that person who knows the blow is coming is at less risk because they can do these things: set their head mm -hmm. uh, and, and glance. The person that's really at risk is the one who doesn't know it's happening, and it's huh. and just comes by surprise. Hmm. And uh, do you see any activities right now, particularly in the high schools where there are the most players? Uh, are there any programs that you're aware of that uh, they're putting in place to try to mitigate this risk? Well, I know they're, you know, they're, they have, the coaches have to go through a, a yearly training program, mm -hmm. which I think is terrific. Uh, and, but, it, you know, I, I think there's not a lot of uh, uniformity among, among the schools. Some have, a, have uh, very clear policies about concussion management and awareness mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and others uh, d do not so it, it'd be nice if we had some uh, uniformity among all the schools in Massachusetts about how they're going to uh, address this issue mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, you had mentioned uh, other protocols um, is there uh, do you know what the reporting requir requirements are here in Massachusetts I don't I'm sorry oh, okay <laughs> <laughs> I believe they do have to report each to the state they okay. have to report a total okay. uh, of the uh, concussions that occur I do believe that they have to put in place a protocol that is uh, uh, nationally approved 
uh, dealing with uh, how they report it, how the student is taken out of circulation and the like. One of the uh, uh, issues is that prior to starting in team sports where there might be trauma, uh, they will take a baseline uh, test. Um, and, uh, in most schools. I don't think it's all schools. But yeah, yeah they do take a, a baseline test. And there's some very well-known ones, like the impact test, which is quite, uh, quite popular. But the problem with these tests, their baseline tests, uh, it's easy to find out how to, how to cheat the test, you know? Mm -hmm. And so athletes who don't want to be pulled out for suspicion of a concussion uh, can actually, you know, test poorly on that baseline test so that they will, uh, the, their standard of removal from the game will be much higher. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, yet another, another issue that I guess parents uh, should be aware of and coaches probably already are aware of. Um, and you had mentioned soccer. Is it really just those two, soccer and football? No, there's lacrosse, there's basketball. I mean, really, anything where there's body-to-body -body contact is, mm -hmm. is and it, collision sports are a greater risk than just contact sports. But, mm -hmm. you know, no sport, you know, cheerleading has a small incidence of concussion. Swimming does, you know, so it's, it's really anything, uh, but there's some sports that have higher yeah, rates. Yeah, it's a little designed in. And, um, Okay. Well, what kind of research have you done in this area? Well, you know, I'm not, I don't really focus on concussions per se, and I don't evaluate pe uh, people with concussions. But the way my work uh, relates to concussion is I, I run the brain bank for the Chronic Traumatic Encephalopathy mm -hmm. Center. I feel like I see what happens when things go wrong. Mm -hmm. and, and luckily, this isn't the usual case, and most people play sports very successfully and live very successful lives, but I unfortunately am in the trenches of seeing the casualties. And uh, I, so we uh, run a very brisk service uh, with brain donations from many sports. It's all, of course, uh, completely voluntary, and, and the families that want to donate the brains after death generally are, are concerned about the individual. Mm -hmm. So there's a selection bias in the sample that I look at. Sure. Uh, families are more motivated if, they're, if they were worried about some behavior or if, or if the individual committed suicide or, or if they noticed uh, memory changes, they're, they're going to be motivated to donate. But um, so what I do is I evaluate the brain for, for, for any condition. I look for any disorder in the brain. But the one that we've been particularly interested in the last seven years is called chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Right. And that's the disease that we first thought was just restricted to boxers back in the 1920s. And then over the, the decades that followed, we, we found out it could happen to physically abused people. It could happen to poorly controlled epileptics. Uh, it could happen to people that were in you know, a dwarf that was in a dwarf throwing contest. I mean, you know, it can be really any activity where there's impact to the head. And then in the uh, uh, mid 2000s, it was described in American football. And of course, because football being such a popular sport uh, that really raised a lot of eyebrows and you've uh, come before the NFL I did I, I went to the NFL in 2009 and I think again I, I can't remember the exact date but I, I think a year later and uh, we presented our initial findings on um, five to eight NFL players who had developed this disease chronic traumatic encephalopathy and um, we were very cons you know we we thought the NFL would be uh, very alarmed, and 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 they were, but it, it took a little time to develop that. And you've testified before Congress. Yes, also also right around the same time, I testified in front of Congress uh, about the risks of uh, mm -hmm. concussions and traumatic brain injuries in sports. And what was the nature of that investigation? Are there, has that led to any kind of legislation or any other action that you're aware of? Oh, I think that was in the beginning, and it was really one of the critical moments when mm -hmm. uh, uh, the nation was much more aware that concussions and uh, long-term damage were, were actually something that could occur in sports. Uh, there was you know, great attention to the National Football League at that point, uh, but, but the, the concussion awareness and uh, st you know, states adopted concussion laws uh, really uh, throughout the nation. Uh, there was a tremendous wave of awareness and, and education in the school system, and that mm. continues to this day. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I don't think it should stop. I, I still think this is a, a, an important public health issue that needs to be addressed immediately. Mm -hmm. OK. And um, could you just sort of summarize what points you'd like to make sure that our viewers take home regarding the risks of concussion, particularly, I would say, among high school students? Well, I think the most important thing I'd like to say is, again, 
physical exercise is the best thing kids can do for themselves, mm -hmm. physically as well as psychologically. But we need to play sports safely. And that means if you're going to participate in a high-risk sport like football, even soccer or hockey, um, you know, adopt skill sets, techniques that reduce the amount of impact to the head mm -hmm. uh, because it's the cumulative exposure to those head impacts uh, that is associated with the development of long-term problems. And that's what we specifically uh, want to avoid. A concussion, uh, most concussions entirely uh, treat, uh, treatable, or at least they reco you recover from them with no consequence. Uh, don't be alarmed if your child has a uh, well-managed single concussion. Mm -hmm. But when you start to get repetitive concussions, especially when the interval between the concussion is shorter and shorter, that's when you have to say to yourself, maybe this is something we, maybe we should consider doing something else. Mm -hmm. And you said that it's related to the number of years of exposure. So right. if someone's, the more years somebody plays football right. or soccer or whatever, the greater their risk of long-term consequences. Right. Uh, and also, the, there's a window of vulnerability. We didn't really get into that. But okay. if you have a second impact uh, in, a, in the vulnerable period, within a few days, of the last impact before the other imp the other concussion is, is recovered before the other brain injury is recovered that can cause very disastrous consequences sometimes even death i mean that's okay. that's that very rare condition sudden, sudden imp Impact syndrome, second impact syndrome, where the athlete uh, has a second impact very close to a first one that wasn't mm -hmm. recovered, and has a, a develops massive cerebral edema. Okay. And so the current protocols you feel are adequate to prevent that from happening as long as that concussion has been diagnosed. Yeah, you want to diagnose be pulled it. Out and you want to be very aware. You want to be aware of your teammates. It's, you know, it's good to check on your teammates and, and, mm -hmm. and report your teammates if you are concerned. Uh, but if there's any question, you know, pull them out. If in doubt, pull them out. So this has all been very interesting. But before we run out of time, I'd like to really look at a model and perhaps have you show us just where the trauma occurs and what, you know, what, this is, uh, what is the issue here. Certainly. So I have a model of a brain here, but okay. I want to point out one very important thing. The, uh, the real brain, the brain that's in, inside your skull, is very gelatinous. It is mm -hmm. like a firm jello, literally. Mm -hmm. And so it's not at all hard like this. So when you have these high velocity hits, linear uh, acceleration, deceleration, but rotational, there is tremendous sloshing and jiggling of the brain, and that's that distortion of the brain that occurs. And it's really, it's really uh, uh, usually a, a linear distortion, right. but it can be this tremendous rotational distortion. That's what causes the injury. The brain is actually uh, uh, ex elongating and stretching, and it's stretching the fibers inside the brain, the axons as well as the blood vessels. Um, where we see the damage the most is in the frontal lobes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so we'll see a lot of damage to the, uh, what we call the superior uh, lateral frontal lobes, which is uh, especially with football, but we see it in all sports, and that uh, really correlates very well with where the location of the impacts, where the, mm -hmm. where the individual gets the hit at head impacts. And we also see them in the temporal lobe, which is the side of the brain. Uh, uh, and again, they're cortical lesions affecting those two regions primarily. And that the locations of the lesions is really why they develop those symptoms of irritability, impulsivity, disinhibition, memory loss, confusion. It really relates to the, where, the areas things, that are yeah. damaged. Okay. And um, so the, the other issue here with the trauma is that you can't do an x-ray and say you've had a, a concussion. No. You can't do an MRI. You can't do a CAT scan and say you've had a concussion or, or even that you, you have the more serious chronic illnesses. Absolutely. That's the problem. It's an invisible injury. Mm -hmm. Not only is it invisible, it's painless. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in terms of like right. you, you damage your knee and you have excruciating pain. This has these vague symptoms, headache, but, but it's not, you know, a, a pain. And you certainly don't see any bleeding, all the things that make us think injury. Uh, so but the fact that it's invisible, that we can't really detect it very easily on scans, mm -hmm. uh, we don't have a specific blood test or any other specific test for it, all of that makes it very difficult. 
So the, the trauma here is interesting. We had touched on the fact that perhaps young ages uh, are, maybe there's a borderline, maybe there's some time where you shouldn't start until an older age, depending on what sport it is. What are your thoughts on that? I think you should wait uh, to, to participate in head, sports with a lot of head contact until you're physically mature. So you have good neck strength, good muscle coordination, you've developed a skill set where you can reduce the number of head impacts. Uh, and I don't know what age that is, I think it differs for all diff uh, kids, it could be 14, it could be, it could be 18. Uh, uh, so I would wait until the body is physically mature. We're concerned about the young athletes, the right. eight eight, 10, 12 year olds because they may be more susceptible to concussion. They take a lot longer time to recover from concussion. And we know that their brain is developing, uh, has high cerebral blood flow. It has high plasticity, high synaptic pruning. It's doing a lot of important things in those, in those late yeah. childhood, adolescent years. And that's why we think it's very uh, sensitive to this injury. Right, their heads are a little bit bigger, their right. necks are a little bit skinnier, Absolutely. their coordination's a little bit worse, Absolutely. a lot of things. Yeah. Well, I think we've covered a lot of important things today. You've, you've really highlighted uh, many things. You've brought your, your knowledge and your experience here to us, and we're really grateful for all that you've done uh, for this show. So I'd like to thank you very much for being with us today. Well, thank you, it was a pleasure. Okay, for more information on concussions and head injuries, please visit our homepage at physicianfocus.org. I'm Dr. Dale McGee. Thank you for watching. Prescription drugs are valuable medications and when taken under doctor's supervision provide effective treatment for many conditions. But the abuse of these powerful drugs has become a serious public health problem resulting in the needless deaths of thousands of people. Most people take medications responsibly, but more than 12 million Americans take prescription painkillers for non-medical reasons, many of them young people. Both physicians and patients can help to reduce the abuse of prescription drugs. Talk with your doctor about the risks and benefits of the medicines and explore different ways to treat pain. The safe use of prescription drugs comes when physicians and patients work together to promote healing and good health. Medicines cure, heal, and relieve pain. Use them carefully, store them securely, and dispose of them properly when no longer needed. For more information, visit drugabuse.gov. I'm Dr. Melissa Wood. And I'm Dr. Nandita Scott. Cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death in American women, claiming nearly 400,000 lives each year, more than all cancers combined. Yet nearly half of women are unaware that heart disease, along with stroke, pose the biggest threats to their health. It is important that women recognize their risk factors for heart disease. Amongst the biggest risks are family history and age. Heart disease that has affected a brother, sister, father, or mother is a particular concern, and the risk rises as we get older. The good news is that many other risk factors can be controlled with lifestyle changes. Keep your blood pressure and cholesterol in check, don't smoke, eat a healthy diet, exercise, and maintain a healthy weight. We urge you to talk with your healthcare provider and get screened to determine your risk of heart disease. For more information, visit the American Heart Association at goredforwomen.org. I'm Dr. Michael Hirsch. I'm Dr. Bob Segge. Deaths and injuries from firearms continue to shine a spotlight on gun violence as a public health issue. The health risk of guns to young people is especially alarming. 
as firearm violence has become a leading cause of death and injury for children and teens. Guns in the home raise special concerns because they significantly raise the risk of homicide, suicide, and unintentional shootings. More than one in three homes with children under 18 now have a gun. If your home has a firearm, we urge you to take precautions to protect your child. Store guns unloaded and locked in a safe with ammunition locked separately and make sure the homes your child visits are safe as well. For more information, visit the Massachusetts Medical Society for a copy of Protecting Your Child from Gun Injury.